became the editor, and in 1978 saw him become the chairperson. In 91, Martin became a spokesperson for the organisation. In his many years of research, Martin has come to realise that there is a, little, a lot more to this phenomenon than just the physical aspect. Martin holds several degrees, including a doctorate in mechanical engineering. And Martin will be talking about, uh, or the question he's asking, this comment is, when is a light flashing through the sky not a meteorite? <laughs> so I'd like to welcome now Mr. Martin Gottschall. <laughs> Thank you, Tina, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, from one end of the pendulum to the other, this is very nuts and bolts what I'm speaking about this morning. But before I begin, I'd like to just add one detail for the record. Jeffrey made reference to a man in Brisbane who had an encounter, I believe an ongoing series of encounters, with a being that um, has a manta-type description. Now this particular being was described to me by this person as having a head almost as wide as his shoulders. But from the neck down, it was a humanoid form. Two arms, two legs, very slender body, very diminished musculature, you know, very straight limbs, but didn't resemble a man to accept the head part, the placement of the eyes and their relative size, and the triangular head shape. Just for the record, that's his description of this particular being. And it's about seven foot tall, according to Okay, well let's go now to the uh, topic of this moment, um, which is of course to, um, to try to define the parameters which in, within which meteors uh, operate. So that when we see something in the sky, and there are some details suggesting a meteor, but other details which are in conflict with that interpretation, we can tell the difference and make the right diagnosis, whatever you want to call it. Okay, so I'll do a little bit of aerodynamics talk now. Here to maybe a hundred or even a thousand times that pressure. 
in this, in, in this compressing and enormous heating takes place, temperatures become incandescent, and that is the source of the glow of the meteor. The, the heat is also um, absorbed by the meteorite itself. Its surface gets very hot, and it radiates as well. So that's where the light comes from. The air is now compressed. It may be compressed 20 or 30 times and heated. The speed of sound goes up to maybe a 1,000 meters per second. Uh, the air is compressed and it has a smaller volume and now it can move at less than the speed of sound, can, be, can behave itself again in a manner similar to the previous diagram. So the shock wave converts um, hypersonic situation where things are happening faster than the speed of sound back into a subsonic situation where a kind of sanity can prevail again. And that shock wave takes this form, it gradually spreads outwards, and in the case of aircraft flying at supersonic speed, we eventually hear that as a boom boom when, when that shock wave passes the ground and we get what we call a sonic boom. I'm not interested with that aspect at the moment, merely with the fact that you get this intense heat in here. Now this uh, flow condition, fortunately, can be characterized by a very simple equation, and we can work out the resistance to that object going through the air at this high speed. When, I, uh, when you then compute this, uh, I can produce a diagram showing you what happens to an object passing through the atmosphere. Uh, I'd like to zoom out, away a bit to get more of the picture. <coughs> Oh, well, I'll, I'll look at portions of it at the time. Okay. Um, we'll forget the text on the top for the moment. On this axis here, I have um, an indicator of speed. And the speed is not in meters per second, but a ratio. The sp initial speed of the object is taken as a reference and the speed of the meteor from then onwards is always going to be less than that because it's being slowed down. At the beginning, the speed ratio is 1. And as the object slows down, its speed is less than the initial value and the ratio goes down till when it's stopped altogether, the speed ratio is 0. And every one of these curves characterizes a particular meteor pass. Note that the horizontal axis represents altitude. Now, the density of the atmosphere decreases as you go up. And there's a rough formula that gives us a sufficiently good description of the, the way it drops off. And that formula is built into this, these graphs. So an object, take for example the case B equals 10. The value of B characterizes a particular uh, meteor flight. If you take B equals 10, you notice um, at an altitude of around about 60 kilometers, it's hardly been slowed at all. It's penetrated that far into the atmosphere with any, without any appreciable change in speed. Then the speed starts to diminish, and by the time you're at 30 kilometers altitude, it has lost a substantial amount of speed. By the time you're at about 20 kilometers altitude, it's going only about half as fast as it did to begin with. And somewhere here, at about 6 or 7 kilometers altitude, it's actually been brought to, or almost brought to a stop. From here onwards, it will continue falling under its own weight. Up to here, it's been slowed down. It's been slowing down faster than gravity, which is about 10 meters per second per second. It's being held back like putting a brake on your car. Um, at this point, it then falls under, under its own weight. We would call it a terminal velocity. I have another graph showing you how terminal velocity varies. Now, the, the uh, fortunate thing is, that the, the variable B contains the size of the meteor, its mass, and also the angle at which it comes into the atmosphere. They don't come straight down. They come at any kind of angle. Those three parameters are all contained within the variable B. And that is why I can tell you all about almost every meteor out of interest on one graph. Otherwise, I'd be fishing out a whole booklet full of graphs for you. It's, it's a very great economy in terms of representing what happened. So we're able to trace the story of a meteorite penetrating our atmosphere, and this diagram illustrates how that happened. 
I want to draw your attention to a few features of this time now. I discovered, for example, that it was the characteristic of the solution to this, uh, to these, to the original differential equations, that the point at which the greatest amount of energy is being dissipated by the returning meteorite happens when the, when the speed is 0.716 of its speed to begin with. No matter which trajectory you're looking at, that's a remarkable constancy, and that's represented by this dashed line. At this moment, most of, most of the energy of the meteorite is being drawn at fastest, I should say, and this is the point where we'd expect it to be the brightest. So that's the moment when it's brightest in the sky because a lot of energy is released and part of that energy becomes light and we see the same. Um, and we can draw other horizontal lines representing other ratios um, of the brightness in terms of the maximum brightness. And this ratio also is a tremendous convenience. It means we don't have to play with megawatts or milliwatts or anything like that. We just have a ratio, a nice simple ratio. Uh, for example, this line here represents a brightness of half the maximum brightness, dissipation of half. And there's another line of 0.5 here. So further you see the meteorite comes in, it brightens up. At this point, it's half as bright as it's ever going to be. Here it's fully bright. Here it's back to half the maximum brightness. And down here it's um, uh, one-tenth of the maximum brightness. Down here it's only one-hundredth of the maximum brightness. It's fading away. Now, a small meteorite, which you can just see, would be characterized by one of the curves out here, with a large B number. In fact, these are about the smallest meteorites you can see. They're just detectable like about Sirius in the sky. But remember, because they're moving, they have to be a little brighter for us to see them. And something standing still where we can take time to get our eyes adapted. <clears throat> so these are in fact the smallest meteorites we can see. And we can probably only see them through a brightness range of about 2 to 1. So you start to see them about here, you see them, see them, and you lose them about here. Gone. Right? That's, that's what happens here. Take, an hour, take one which is maybe a hundred times brighter. You'll see it back here somewhere when it's only one hundredth of its full brightness. Keep seeing it, keep seeing it, keep seeing it, until here. When, when it's gone back to about a hundredth of its greatest brightness. So the brighter meteors are seen longer, seen for a longer atmospheric descent. And usually they're seen for a longer time. Um, I hope that sort of illustrates uh, the kind of uses you can put this information to. Um, I mentioned that the variable B Uh, contains a certain amount of information about the size of the meteorite and its mass, which I've chosen here to characterize uh, in terms of composition. This orbit I've shown here, just a portion of the planet, and uh, the, this, this uh, piece of space track is still essentially in low Earth orbit, but it's coming down and it's about, <laughs> it's about to really copper, right? So you, it's, it's in the lower atmosphere now, that is to say, maybe 100 kilometers, 120 kilometers up, and, and it's glowing bright enough to be seen. And it's still following essentially an orbital path. If you're standing at the point A, here, you'll see it coming over the horizon here. And as it moves, it'll come up and it'll go overhead, and then it'll go past and go down again. At this point here, it'll go down on the horizon again. And of course, if you've got trees and buildings, you may only see it for a portion of that and this gives us some idea of the longest you can see a piece of space jump. This is the longest possible sighting of a piece of space jump when you see it from the horizon, right, the other horizon. And it, uh, it works out in the text that uh, you're looking at. I think it's, uh, remember this, this object is doing about 8 kilometers per second. We've got something of the order of 2,800 kilometers of distance. So that gives you an idea. To divide 2,800 by 800, What's that about? About 30 seconds, something over the order of 30 or 40 seconds. Not minutes, less than a minute. Okay? These are the parameters for a meteorite in space time. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions for Martin? <laughs> about a year ago, I was sitting in my 
bedroom <coughs> at home. I was watching TV, <coughs> pardon me, um, I have a large window about two metres to my left. I was concentrating on the TV facing basically forward when a brilliant light took my peripheral vision out, out of the window. Um, the window is probably about, about that sort of waist height sort of thing and up. And up. Um, now I just had time to draw away, go the two metres to the window. Now it looked to me as though it was um, a, a bright sort of diamond light, very bright with sort of blue, blue flashes. It seemed to be also segmented into about three cylinders, or, or roughly cylinder shaped. But I don't know whether that was a trick of, trick of vision or, or whether that was it or not, because the duration would be probably one, one and a half seconds maximum. Um, I just had time to basically catch it in peripheral vision, go over the two metres, watch it disappear into the horizon. I went to go, or, or watch it go behind a tree actually. I went to grab the door, open the door, go outside, and it was gone. Um, I've got a fairly small arc of horizon. Um, I've got forest at around about that degree. That's about 10 degrees up. Yeah, about forest from about there. I've got a big uh, tree about there, which it went behind. That's when I went outside. So, and with, with, the, with the ceiling, when I'm looking, I probably only had it, because the top of the window was only about that, that degree. Now, I rang up Sydney University afterwards to see if there are any reports, and apparently an amateur astronomer in Penrith uh, was setting up his uh, telescope for the night and reported it as a, as a meteor, and um, a woman in Warunga was outside of her house because she just reported a neighbour's house who was burning down, and she was already in an upstate, upset state, and this thing went over and she thought she was being invaded as well, so she was very upset. Um, so that, this was almost identically at that time. Warunga is probably about uh, 120 kilometres north of Hilltop where I live. And this was, this was reported all about exactly the same time. Can I use you as a guinea pig mm. and ask you a few questions on how one might elicit information useful in this process? You were sitting inside a lighted room. Your eyes were accustomed to nighttime lighting. I just had the TV. I just had the uh, TV light or a lamp on top of the TV, the main light was out. Okay, uh, that's alright. Uh, we'll do this roughly, don't be too yeah. I know in, in the real case it would take two, um, two hours of this, <laughs> but we won't do it now. And you were looking at, at an angle of perhaps 10 or 15 degrees to the object? Yeah, I was sitting in my chair yeah. and I would estimate, I'm no judge of degrees, but, but the bottom of the window <coughs> would be about... Just, just a yes or no will do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now the, the object was bright. Was it bright enough to light up the ground around you? No. Okay. Well, that one thing I did notice, though, the, the, uh, my initial reaction was that it was a plane because its trajectory was very, very flat. Uh, right, I, didn't get, I didn't okay. get onto the trajectory till about there because that was the top of the window. Okay. And then even that was peripherally. By the time I turned my head, it had moved a little bit further on. It, it appeared to be yeah. very flat, the trajectory. Okay. okay. Well, um, if you look at this diagram, these little numbers i, they represent, excuse me, those little numbers that are characterized by i represent the brightness in terms of watts per square meter of illumination on the ground immediately below. The sun is about here, it's about 1000 watts per square meter, that's about daylight brightness. Okay? If that happened, you couldn't miss it, right? Um, you were probably operating somewhere here, 10 to the minus 8 or something of that order. Right, so that's about the kind of meter we were looking at. You would have had to be at an altitude of about 50 odd kilometers for you to for it to be at its maximum brightness. So that's a good choice. So if it was at an angle of 15 degrees, 50 kilometers up, we can work out how far away it was. It would have been a couple of hundred kilometers of that order. I don't have my calculator here, but it's of that order. Okay. Um, and if it was if it was doing say um, say 20 kilometers a second. 200 kilometers away. Its angular rate would have been um, 20 over 200, or which is what, 0 0.1 radian per second. This is 0 0.1 radian per second. Does that the description? Well, as I said, because it was only a, a, a one second, maybe back, one, yeah. one, one, one and a half seconds. I can only go by your, your recollection, yeah. but you would have had to do this sort of thing in well, your view. Over, over that way, yeah. all I can remember is, as I said, that it was seemed to be traveling 
will just flatten it. Now, there could have been a, a slight yeah, variation. Don't worry there. about the fine detail, right? Yeah. See, the, 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 what I'm getting at, all these things have to match up. If this was a meteor, it had to be about that altitude, and it had to sort of, your line of sight had to pan at about that rate, and so on. And if, if, if these don't reasonably match up within the precision of your estimates, then the meteor notion gets less and less tenable. Another one, important one is apparent size. From the way they spoke, I thought this thing was more than a point of light in the sky. Yes. Now that's an important one, because notice we've got a notion of what, how far it had to be away to be a meteor, about 200 kilometers. Now anything which has an, uh, even a, a, um, a, an apparent size of even a millimeter at arm's length is um, one six hundredth of that distance in size. That's one sixtieth or six hundredths of that distance, which is by tens of meters. Now, an um, um, asteroid coming down at, with a mass of tens of meters size, you wouldn't know about it. Half of some town would be missing. Okay? So the, the apparent size often allows us to say, that couldn't have been a meteorite. But if it was, if it came down, we could not but know. You know? Even if it's that sort of order of size, coming and if it survived down to the lower atmosphere, you get enormous sonic activity, sonic booms and shocks and windows broken, you name it. Um, and if, you know, there are all these checks and balances in the interpretation until all the I's are dotted and, and, and all the T's are crossed. Um, you can very often say, look up the meteor notion, it's got too many problems here. Um, and I, I might just, if I may, um, deal with the re I referred to a sighting yesterday uh, of a couple of meteorite-like sightings that came to us on Tuesday of this week. And um, one was Mill Marin and one was from Redland Bay. And they were very close in time and apparently the same object. And they were seen at an elevation of about this and the two observers were about 240 kilometers apart. Um, and the apparent size was the issue. I won't even go into the rest. Both sets of witnesses said it was big, it was big. One sort of was about full moon size, one sort of was about the size of their fists. Now, people tend to overestimate, and you know, you've got to really get to them face to face to get apparent size right. But it was not a point in the sky. It wasn't like a satellite, little point moving. It was nothing like that. Um, therefore, um, just from this sort of thinking, if that was an astronomical body, it was almost a kilometer in size. Um, and we, we wouldn't be talking if something like that came down. So, so we're left with a much more plausible hypothesis this thing was much lower down in the atmosphere, maybe only a kilometre or so up, was more like the size of a bus or something of that order, and was glowing very bright and going very fast, because it was seen 240 kilometres apart. It was only a matter of minutes between the two sightings. And it was only reported by two people. Something that big and bright, that high up, is seen by everybody in the South Queensland area. We would get dozens of reports. We don't. We get just two spot reports, because it was only seen by people over a pass of a few kilometers as it moved. And it might only have been bright here, dimmed down, then brightened up again somewhere else. Now, it's much more plausible to think in terms of an object doing that kind of thing to explain that sighting than an, a meteor. Because a meteor suggests a whole lot of other consequences and the data hasn't got them and should have them. This is the kind of thinking I found useful because it's so easy when you see an object, the tail, meteor and you disregard 90% of the other good data, which happens not to fit that notion. But until you quantify, you don't know whether you're in the right ballpark or not. Mark, I'm just going to, oh, sorry. I'm just going to say another very good way of determining apparent size, what I, I, something that astronomers use is called the moon test. You say to someone, look, imagine you're holding your arm, your hand out like that. How many fingers would it take to cover the full moon? And people say, oh, it might be all oh, one, two, three fingers. So in actual fact, if you go out tonight and look at the full moon, it's half a finger. Yeah. That gives you, you an idea of how good the observer is. Yes. So, so if yeah. people say it gets twice the size of the full moon, how big's the full moon? Okay, it's, uh, oh, it's one finger and it was three times, okay, three fingers at arm's length. It works extremely well. Thank you. I just I was trying to ask a question there. Last we question. can have a light.
accommodate an object far away in space, which uh, usually has got a lot of water associated with it. When the sun warms it, the water evaporates and has a big halo that reflects sunlight. And we see that halo often has a tail too, and that's a comet. It's way out in space, you know, it's a different thing. It's, not, it's never going to hit the ground, or it may, parts of it may if they come close. But we're basically, it's not in our atmosphere. It's illumined by sunlight. This thing is illumined by frictional heating as it's flashing through the sky, through our lower atmosphere. Um, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, well, we're running. Okay. One, just one more to run into the lunch break. Just two things, Martin. Uh, also, there's daylight sightings of meteorites that are uh, worth uh, noting uh, for people. Yes. Um, and the other thing I, sh I should uh, indicate to you, as researchers, you also uh, should note that through the day, uh, sorry, through periods of the year, you'll get certain months where you'll have showers. So, as researchers, you should uh, uh, be aware that certain periods of the time of the year there'll be a lot of shares available. So you can actually predict to when a lot of reports will come in. Uh, and the other thing I'd like to ask you, uh, the skip effect, like uh, bouncing a, a pebble across the water, uh, is that what the I've got your material, have you um, adjusted for that factor uh, in regards to uh, the actual object bouncing? I have not. I've, I've assumed that the, that the object the entering the atmosphere is just a, uh, roughly a spheroidal body, has no lift properties at all develops drag only yes. and won't skip. There's not a flat disc that it can that it can skip off. That it develops lift forces. No lift forces. Obviously a real meteorite can develop lift forces which might display, display a curve or, or, or things like that. Well these are complications I didn't know into. But to, to pick up on you, if it was visible in daylight, you'd be looking at the curves over here rather than the curves over there which are visible at night time. Which you can, um, so the diagram I think covers the range fairly well, and I hope we'll prove useful to some of you. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank uh, Mark Gottschall. <laughs> so we one was a discussion on active force, which was intended to include a discussion of changes to the existing Australian sightings report form, and the other one was a discussion period. Um, it's three minutes to one o'clock, our scheduled lunch break. I don't think, I don't want, want to go more than five minutes past one o'clock. So I'd like to um, greatly compress um, what, what was originally intended here, because I think we have a very full afternoon program and it shouldn't be spoiled by any lateness from the morning's program. So instead of discussing the future of ACUFOS, which is the Australian Centre of UFO Studies, I would merely like to introduce to you the fact that there is such a body, it came into being in about 1974, and it's reached a fairly critical point in its um, history, I suppose, where um, we have to, I believe, look at um, the, the management of this body changing so that its committee comprises people from a right around the country and somehow, although geographically separated, they manage to use the telephones and taxes and other things to act as a single committee. But I, I don't propose to discuss that or its difficulties here now. I don't think there's any point in that. I want to give notice to the fact that the ACUFOS issued a sightings report from form in the late 1970s, 79, which is still used by our association, UFO Research Queensland, and is very much due for overall. So uh, this is a request to everyone interested. If you have suggestions about the new Australian sightings report form, please send it in to either ACIFOS or UFO Research Queensland um, so that uh, it can be considered together with all other suggestions in the production of what we hope will soon be a new and more effective form. With that I've dealt with another big swag. Um, <coughs> discussion papers similarly are going to have to be greatly uh, compressed. We have a large body of material here that was to serve as discussion paper. I think much of it's going to become reading for you later on. There are still plenty of copies out there. I do commend it to you as um, a source of a whole lot of ideas uh, and topics that this conference could and ought to have considered to had time allowed. Um, <coughs> I refer you to the um, presentation by Michael Hesseman last night, particularly to what he had to say about his researchers on the Roswell footage. And, uh, to the 
possibility that despite all the claims to the contrary, perhaps that footage is genuine and that the authorities saw fit to allow genuine autopsy footage to, become, to come into the public domain. Um, for the first time last night, that motion yes, sort of became quite real to me. Um, and I think that's probably the most significant thing that could have happened in this conference. That something as, as central to the UFO scene as uh, real aliens uh, may be contained in that Roswell footage that is a true and good evidence of real aliens. Um, in addition to the wide variety of others that have been reported to us, as for example, Jeffrey Spiro. Um, and really, we could spend the whole afternoon discussing and speaking on the implications of what Michael Hesemann said last night, and we would not be wasting our time, believe me. So, as often happens in these conferences, there are far more issues to deal with than we have time to do. This afternoon, we have a very important program on as well, and it's centers largely about the abduction issue. It's something we have to have a handle on. We wouldn't want to compromise uh, that program uh, this morning, but except to commend to you the great significance of what happened last night here. I believe it's one of the, it will remain one of the key things that we'll remember this conference for, for the next decade or two. If, if the killer will permit, yeah, we might just leave it there and terminate questions of all there will be millions of them. And I, um, I commend these papers to you, perhaps take them with you, perhaps read them, perhaps comment on them in your publications or write to us, create discussion in the literature because we can't discuss it all in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin.